Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, it's very early over here in Perth, and it's um, I'm sure it's, uh, uh, you're onto your second coffee in the uh, eastern states and in, in South Australia and Northern Territory as well. It's lovely to see you today. Um, uh, my name's Andrew Whitehouse, and I'm the Chief Research Officer of the Autism CRC, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. Now, this is the second in the series that we've done all throughout Autism Awareness Month. Now, um, our Autism Month uh, webinars throughout April uh, share some of our latest <coughs> research outcomes across the Early years will be adult This next webinar is going to focus on the early years and diagnosis. But before we get started, I just want to let you know that you have the opportunity to submit some questions uh, by typing your questions into the question pane, which is just on the right hand side of your screen. So that side. Um, uh, this should be appearing on the right hand side of the screen. And if you like to send a question in, um, please just include the name of, uh, of the presenter who your question is directed to. Uh, you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect them and make sure uh, we get to as many as possible during the um, end of today's presentation. So today's topic, um, the early years. Uh, the Autism CRC is working on improving earlier and more accurate diagnosis of autism for earlier intervention, interventions by harnessing existing knowledge of autism to improve diagnosis as well as breakthroughs in biological research to identify subtypes of autism and the most effective interventions for these subtypes. Now, that was a bit of a mouthful, but essentially the overarching theme is the Autism CRC is trying to create the best opportunity for kids to reach their full potential in adulthood right from the get-go. Now, today we're going to be joined by um, Professor Valsa Eben, Dr Josephine Barbaro and Dr Kai Evans, who will each share with us the latest information about CRC Program 1 research projects. So, over to our first presenter. Our first presenter today is Professor uh, Valsama Eben. Now, Vals Valsa is our Autism CRC Program 1 Director and how lucky we are that she is, um, which means that she oversees all of the research and operations for our Early Years Program. This role was a natural progression for Valsa, who has greatly contributed to the program of research since 2013. Now, in addition to her role with the Autism CRC, um, Valsa doesn't sleep uh, because she's also the Chair of Infant, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, she's the head of, uh, at the University of New South Wales, she's the head of the Academic Unit of Psychiatry at the Southwest Sydney Local Health District um, and Stream Director for the Clinical Academic Group in the SPHERE Consortium. Now, Today, Valsa is going to speak to us about how autism subtyping uh, uh, of preschool age children can help identify the best early intervention supports for each child. So without further any, uh, any further delay, I'm going to shut up and pass over to Valsa. Over to you, Valsa. Hi, good morning again. Um, I'm going to cover how subgrouping children with autism might help us to identify the best early intervention supports that's necessary for each child. We all have come to appreciate that autism is autism, which means there is a significant variability in what causes it, how it presents, how the treatment response would work for each person. And it's a bit similar to diabetes, if you like. Some have got it very mild, you just adjust a bit of diet and lifestyle, others need medication, others need insulin. But the issue with autism is that we have got limited understanding about this variability. And when I say variability, that also means that there are similarities within. Um, and so the Autism CRC subtyping project is looking at that in a bit more detail. And the core issue here is what would work for whom and why. And we all said that there is variability, which means one size wouldn't fit for all. And we all also know that the outcomes between different interventions, as well as between children receiving the same intervention is really great and varied. And so the idea is, can we have subgroups which would more or less predict what outcomes would look like and then match the intervention? I'll give an example. We all appreciate intention of behavior or goal directedness, which is very important for us to organize ourselves when we are understanding and responding to social cues, behavioral cues around us. I'm pouring water from a jug and someone holds out a cup and then I automatically understand the intention of that behavior. That's because of my ability to monitor and respond to that goal directedness of that behavior. And we do that in our everyday life, whether it's social cues about behaving, um, about actual goal intended behaviors around us. So can we find out the similarities and differences between individuals with autism? 
and thereby also find out those who have got similar profile. Would that be about the child's child characteristics of the child, the way they respond to intervention, what's the role of the family and the psychosocial factors, and how about the genetic underpinning that each one of us come with? And we have been um, um, very successful with our opportunity to link in and collaborate with the autism specific early learning and care centers and looking at also their transition outcomes after receiving intervention there. Regardless of whether the child goes to a center in Western Australia or in New South Wales, we have the same measures on these children at the entry to the center when they exit after the intervention. We also know about the intervention variables, what educational placement they've gone to, and we are also looking at how they are transitioning into the school after the intervention. So when I say child profile, it's not just about the autism symptoms, but also the cognitive level of the child, the behaviors of the child, which includes both the adaptive and the maladaptive behaviors, and also the sensory profile. And we have come to note that, particularly when it comes to school transition and integrating into this environment of the classroom, is sometimes more important the behavioral and the sensory profile than the autism symptomatology. So in a way, if we were to know the profile at entry, is there something can we, that we can do to make the core elements of the principles of intervention to match that? If, depending on the visual attention of the child, can we have the visual learning slightly modified for the child? Again, joint attention is very important. Joint attention means, hey, look, when we say to a child, we are sharing something physically out there and also mentally in our mental space. And that's very important for us to participate in sensory social routines. For a child with good joint attention, maybe the sensory social routine um, can take off without much a problem. But those who have got very, very, very limited joint attention, maybe we have to modify the, the routines and the, and the learning platforms that we use. Similarly, if a child comes with minimally uh, verbal children with minimal verbal skills, should we be doing something to match that? So we, earlier on, um, we looked at the preliminary data set. And we were looking at, yes, all children would um, make progress when they are provided the early intensive intervention, but can we tell for whom and why? And we found for, what we found was that those children with higher social affect and play skills seem to, to kind of respond better. And those with greater initial social impairments seem to be making less progress. And so we started asking the question, those with greater social effect um, versus those with minimal social effect, should we be changing the dose, should we be modifying the intervention, and so on and so forth. So again, we had been looking at language at, at entry, and we found that baseline visual reception and receptive language was an important predictor of improvement in the receptive expressive communication post-intervention. Expressive language was particularly important for receptive communication post-intervention. We looked at the age at entry. We looked at the duration of intervention. No surprises there, anger age seemed to predict better communication domain and receptive communication at exit. Longer duration of intervention predicted better outcomes. And when we looked at the school transition outcomes, we were already surprised, much more than the cognitive ability, it was the adaptive behavior that was important for the child's participation in the classroom, being comfortable with the teacher, engaging, being assertive in the classroom, et cetera. And that kind of then builds on to the social skills, et cetera. So that said about the um, clinical picture, how about the biology? How about our brain being wired differently? And the, our hypothesis is that um, the biological impairment in autism is that the neural social reward circuitry is not as active as it should be. We all get great excitement, social reward or a kick when we are in socially engaging situations. But the biology and the brain wiring of children with autism is such that they are not very excited by that kind of thing. So initially, uh, although the parents would try very hard or the caregivers would try hard to engage them, they probably are not interested, they are not responding, and sometimes they would actively resist. So all that opportunity for social learning, children are like a sponge, they imitate, they observe, they learn, they do, they kind of uh, go on with it. So in a way, that social milieu of learning happens when they are engaging in that social milieu or home environment. But if you are not interested and you drift more and more into the outer ring and outer realms of that social milieu, then those opportunities are much more difficult 
to, to be available to them. And that's part of the intervention that we should be doing to get them back into that, that circle of learning. So we looked at the brain wiring in a way, the neural circuitry, and are there differences? So the idea there is that if there are differences in the way we attend to social cues, um, then maybe the intervention to, should uh, attend to that. And through brain plasticity, which is very much available in that early years, maybe we can make better gains in that circuitry to come alive a bit more to the full potential of the child. So we've been using neuroimaging techniques like the near infrared spectroscopy, we've been using MRI, eye tracking EEG, and ERP. Now, coming about we're talking about ERP, we know that evoke response potential activity when you see a photograph of your mother versus a photograph of a stranger is very different. Normally, a phase specific evoke response potential component, which we call the N170, is larger to a phase stimulus and it's more on the right hemisphere. But in ASD, what we see is that it's almost larger for non phase. If you show an object like a furniture, you see a much larger response than when you're seeing a face. Similarly, if you show cartoon figures on a screen and look at the fMRI activation of the amygdala, we find that cartoon figures, it's the same. But when you see a familiar face on the screen, it changes for a child with autism versus the control child. So how does our brain respond when presented with a social versus a non-social stimuli was how we tried to understand the brain circuitry. So this is an example of a social stimulus. So this is the wheels on the bus go round and round nursery rhyme being sung in a very emotive way, a lot of gesturing, a lot of facial expression. And here is a spinning object toy. Normally what you would see is that the red, the dark red is showing the greater activity and you're seeing it on the lower part of the temporal cortex and that's when presented with a social stimuli. That's uh, the typical adult control. But on the right, you see that typically the anterior regions would show greater activity when they are seeing the um, visual social stimuli as opposed to the object oriented one. And similarly, when you look at phases, the red is when you are um, seeing a familiar face and recognizing the face. It's a fusiform face area that red is uh, indicating, whereas the blue is indicating non-face, like an object that was presented. You see the red is totally missing in the ASD, while the blue is perfectly fine. It's similar in both settings. So again, the way we respond to social stimuli, non-social stimuli, the functioning of the brain was the basis of those projects. Similarly, we looked at the structure and we found eight brain regions to be showing group differences between uh, individuals with ASD and we subgrouped them into three. The first one had larger brain regions in the frontal lobe, smaller brain region in the temporal parietal area. The temporal parietal area is the one that I earlier alluded to as the social stimuli response region. So we find that when you have got a as a larger frontal lobe, you've got higher nonverbal skills, but the smaller region of the temporal parietal meant they had lower social skills. And another group had across the ball smaller brain region, which meant they uh, clinically showed lower nonverbal and social scores. Whereas group three had, on the whole, compared to controls, larger brain regions, and they were much higher in their nonverbal and social scores clinically. So moving on now then from clinical to neurocognitive, now to genetic profile, just like clinically autism is heterogeneous, genetically also it is heterogeneous. So we had been all along looking at the clinical presentation, which we call the outward presentation is the phenotype and trying to understand subgroups based on the clinical presentation. And we have not been very successful. That's because complex neurodevelopmental disorders, the link between the genetic underpinning and the clinical presentation is not straightforward. I'll show that using this example. If you look at the first box, gene one leading to a particular clinical phenotype. Phenylketonuria is an example. It's a single gene disorder. It relates to a particular clinical presentation. But in the second box, you've got gene two, three, and four resulting in the same clinical presentation. For example, fragile X syndrome, red syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, all that can result in autism-like clinical picture. 
in the last box, the, the one on the right, the same gene resulting in clinical phenotypes, because we now know that the same gene had been attributed and implicated in ADHD, in autism, and a number of other conditions. So we said, okay, what, what do we do here? So now we are trying to do things uh, worldwide, internationally, a uh, reverse strategy. It's called the genotype first approach. So you've got a whole lot of people in that first box, as you see, um, we get a cohort of people with autism, you get the clinical picture, you look at their genetic profile. And then when looking at the genetic profile, we found that the light uh, blue shared people, four of them, for argument's sake, had a particular gene abnormality on the Catherine A gene. So you go back and then look at those four people and say, what are the clinical features for that, for them, of that subgroup? And lo and behold, what you find is, in addition to autism symptoms, they have got big head, which is macrocephaly, very specific facial features, and also gastrointestinal complaints. So you've got a subgroup there. But having said that, biology is not destiny. Biology is an important starting point on which you build our blocks, and, and the brain development goes that way. But there is a significant important element that's important for brain to grow and develop. Just because you come with the potential, you don't realize the full potential. So the intervention is very key. It's those learning opportunities that's going to determine the outcome for each child. Because the activities that children engage in across their daily life is either building a more social communicative brain or a more object-oriented brain. And early intensive intervention can alter the developmental trajectory to be more socially acumen to be developing. So in conclusion, understanding the clinical and genetic heterogeneity or variability can be a very critical first step in our tailoring of intervention to subgroups. And in addition to providing potential explanations to the family about why a child may not be responding in a particular way, it can also help us to assess better, a improved understanding of what really is going on behind the scenes and then the tail of the management. So every individual on the spectrum has the right to optimal management. And we hope that the identification of homogeneous subgroups will provide a better understanding as to which treatment would work for whom and why, which in turn would significantly improve the outcomes resulting in personal, social, and economic benefits. Thank you very much, Val. So that was fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. What, what we'll do now is we'll move straight on um, and we'll move on to our next speaker and we'll hold off our um, questions until the end, but we're getting them all in. So thank you very much. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Josie Barbaro. Uh, Josie is an autism CRC project leader and a research fellow with the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre at La Trobe University in Melbourne. Josie's research interests are in the early identification and diagnosis of autism in infants and toddlers, as well as family health and wellbeing following the point of diagnosis. Um, her developmental surveillance program for autism, the Social Attention and Communication Study, has been translated and disseminated widely, both nationally and internationally. And Josie will be telling us more about this study today, as well as the, the award-winning mobile app, app AS Detect. So over to you, Josie. Thanks, Andrew. So, oops, sorry, just there we go. I'm just going to move that over there so I can see my screen. Uh, so thanks everyone for um, having me today. So um, I'll be talking today about uh, a project called the Social Attention and Communication Studies, um, Andrew mentioned. Um, and this is really about uh, universal um, early developmental surveillance for autism. Um, in uh, uh, maternal child health settings, um, but also as I'll talk about a bit later, um, also worldwide through a, a, an autism um, app that we've uh, developed. So the current diagnosis for autism in Australia is around about 4.1 years of age as we found in our study. I um, mean, if you have a look um, at this uh, map here, you'll see that there is variability across each of the states for uh, diagnosis, uh, with the Northern Territory having the highest 
uh, mean age at 53 months, which really means that they are lagging behind in terms of identifying their children at the earliest possible opportunity. So we really need to work um, towards being able to identify children much earlier than this because we know that we can identify um, and diagnose children um, by 18 to 24 months of age. And as uh, Valsa uh, touched on, uh, early detection and diagnosis really does maximise children's developmental outcomes and also their learning opportunities. And also show you some data a bit later um, on um, our children that we have uh, monitored and their outcomes later on. So the social attention and communication study has been running for a number of years now. I've actually grown quite old with this study. So it started with my PhD and we've brought, uh, brought a, a revised version uh, into the Autism CRC uh, along with uh, my colleagues, Leo Ridgway um, and Cheryl Disanaika at OTARC. And so what the SACS involves is, um, the methodology is based on the original SACS study. So if you'd like to read about it, it is published in uh, peer reviewed literature um, uh, and you can uh, email me if you can't access that literature. Um, and so what we've done in this study is we have uh, trained maternal and child health nurses in eight local councils in Melbourne um, on early social communication milestones. And I'll go through what those are in a minute. Um, and the training was um, three and a half hours uh, in duration. Um, and videos, we showed videos comparing children with and without autism. Um, and we trained nurses um, on how to uh, enter this uh, information into an online database into Salesforce. Uh, children were monitored um, at their 12, 18 and 24 month consultations and then followed up at 42 months. Um, and children who are at high likelihood for autism um, at either their 12, 18 or 24 month co consultations were uh, sent to us uh, at the SACS team for referral. I'm just going to move that down there. There we go. Um, and so uh, children, uh, we assess children uh, every six months until they were two um, for a gold standard diagnostic assessment involving um, diagnostic tools such as the ADOS and the ADI. Um, and we followed up these children at 42 months of age to confirm their diagnosis and to track their developmental progress as well. So these are the items that we train nurses to look for, or the behaviours to look for at each of these ages. So if we look at 12 months, for example, you can see here that we uh, train nurses to look to see whether or not children can engage in pointing to share things, um, in, in eye contact, um, in uh, consistently responding to their name, um, in copying others' actions, so imitation, uh, in using gestures such as waving, and also other items such as smiling when other people smile at them, use of joint attention, so when someone points or looks to something, does that child follow their point or their gaze, and also in the use and understanding of language. But you'll notice that some of these uh, items here are in green and some are in blue. So the ones that are in green are what we consider key items. And these are behaviours that differentiate children who go on to have autism to children who go on to have other developmental conditions such as developmental or language delay. So if a child is not able to engage in three of the of five of these behaviours, then they are considered at high likelihood for autism. And this is based on the results of our first study. So the results for, for the SACS are so far is that we've monitored over 14,000 children within our maternal child health system between one and two years of age. 323 of these children have been found at high likelihood for autism and 234 have been assessed. 89 uh, parents declined um, participation in the study, but we are consistently and continually trying to follow up these parents either via phone or through the maternal child health nurse because um, some of them may not have come in, but they're happy for us to contact them to, uh, to find out what the, the outcome of their child was. So of the 234 children assessed, 192 children ended up with a diagnosis of autism. Um, of the children that declined, we estimated that 74 of these uh, children would have ended up with a diagnosis of autism based on our, uh, on our study. Um, and we also found that 61 children were not identified between one and two, but they were identified by 42 months of age. 
So if we combine the children that we assessed, um, the children um, the children that we assessed that had autism, the estimated number of children that may have had autism that did not come in for an assessment, and the children also that we uh, found uh, at by 42 months of age, the prevalence in this entire sample of autism is uh, one in 43, or just over 2%. And the prevalence that we found between one and two years of age was just under 2%. So this is very consistent with um, international studies on um, early autism uh, identification but also prevalence rates for autism. So just looking at the breakdown of children assessed here. So if you can see here this yellow line here, um, this uh, is what we call the positive predictive value or the accuracy of um, our method for identifying children with autism. So the overall accuracy or the positive predictive value is 82%, which is really fantastic because the next best tool that's in use in community-based samples to identify autism is called the MCHAT the modified checklist for autism in toddlers, and its positive predictive value in community-based samples is at best uh, 13% that we've found. So um, it really is outperforming any other screening tool that's available. And even when we look at results at 12 months of age, 72% of children identified at 12 months at high likelihood for autism go on to have a diagnosis. So it's very, very um, accurate. Um, I, I know that many of our listeners would be interested in uh, the uh, gender um, uh, differences between the amount of boys and girls who go on to have autism. So you'll notice here that at 12 months of age, we are identifying many, many more boys than we are girls. So the ratio is one um, girl for every 6.7 uh, boys. But as you can see, as we go to 18 and 24 months of age, we are doing better in identifying more girls. So it goes, um, the ratio is then 1 to 3.8 and then 1 to 3.4. So the overall ratio we're finding in our study is 1, um, 1 to 4. So this is consistent with um, other studies, um, but we know that we may still be missing um, girls in this age range. And I am looking at this um, through some research, looking at uh, if we are missing some of these girls early on. I was also interested in um, of the boys and of the girls who were referred to us, who were at high likelihood for autism, how many of them actually ended up with a diagnosis of autism. So you'll see that at 24 months of age, boys and girls were equally as likely to receive a diagnosis of autism, so 85%. But you'll see here at 18 months, 64% of um, females went on to, to have a diagnosis, whereas 88% of males went on to have a diagnosis. So there is a, a difference there, um, but overall, of all the children who come in, of the females who come in, 74% end up with a diagnosis and 84% of males end up with a diagnosis. So it is something to still unpack. We haven't done any analyses there, but I just wanted to show you um, what is happening in terms of uh, boys and girls who are being referred to our study. So overall, we've found that uh, developmental surveillance, surveillance uh, using the SACS um, is the most effective method for the early identification of autism up to date that we've found. There have been no other studies that have been able to have uh, as high a positive predictive value as the SACS. Um, it has excellent psychometric properties. And the reason for this is because of our use of developmental surveillance. So we really do advocate for the use of professional observations repeatedly across time, whether that's nurses or GPs or other allied health professionals. Um, we really do need to be monitoring children across time using professional observations in, in combination with parental report. But if we're only using parental questionnaires at one time point, we are going to miss many of these children because that's what many of these uh, screening tools uh, that don't have very high positive predictive value are using. So the overall purpose or the overall aim of this study is really to, to provide the vital next step for facilitating long-term outcomes for these children. So the long-term outcomes that we've found um, in children that were identified in our first SAC study back in 2006, we followed them up all the way up to seven to nine years of age. And we looked at their cognitive um, abilities as well as other things as well. But we did found massive improvements in um, 
cognitive abilities. So at 24 months, 64% of children had an intellectual developmental delay or intellectual disability. Um, and this decreased to eight months by seven to nine years of age. So we followed up these children and only 8% of our children with autism had an intellectual disability. And the sample had an average IQ um, of uh, 103 uh, and nearly 104. So that is within the, the average limits of an I, of IQ. So that's really fantastic because we do want to try and minimise the disability that can be associated with autism. Um, and if you are able to minimise uh, cognitive impairments, then you can maximise the ability for people on the spectrum to live independent lives and to live um, uh, to, the, to the fullest of their potential. Um, when we compared our children um, who were diagnosed early at two years of age to those who were diagnosed later between three to five years of age, so this is a control group of children that we recruited, when we compared these two groups, we found that um, there were a number of differences. So in terms of school placement, 77% 77 of children diagnosed early in our study attended mainstream school in comparison to only 58% of children who were diagnosed later. In terms of ongoing support, 60% of children diagnosed early are receiving ongoing support in comparison to 90% of children diagnosed later. So children in the SACS cohort were diagnosed significantly earlier than control, so 18 months earlier. They began intervention at a significantly younger age, so 12 months earlier, and they received significantly more early intervention than children in the control group, 11 months earlier. Sorry, 11 months more early intervention. So um, those are the results of uh, the SAC study. Um, and what we wanted to do was really make these results or this, um, this uh, evidence available to people right around the world. And that's why we developed an app called AS Detect. Now this is a parent-led mobile application for education and early detection of autism. And what it does is it uses the SACS items and video-led education. And it bridges the gap between the need for effective early autism identification and the limitations of service provision. And this is even true in developing countries because by 2020, there'll be 6 billion smartphone users worldwide and 80% of these users will be from the developing world. So there really is enormous scope for the use of AS Detect in these countries. So the way that it works is that the SACS behaviours are monitored at 12, 18 and 24 months of age. Um, it contains short videos and verbal descriptions of behaviours observed, followed by a question and activity. And there's an automatic calculation of children's likelihood for autism, so whether it's high or low likelihood. It provides parents with next steps and it emphasises that it is not a diagnosis. It's meant to be a tool to facilitate discussion between parent and um, practitioner. So as of September, um, uh, uh, sorry, that should be data as of, not September, that's data as of now, so that's uh, April 2018. Um, we've had uh, over 20,000 downloads. Uh, we've had 12,000 assessments completed, and you'll notice that more males and females actually have been um, entered into the app by parents. Um, and 21% of children end up with a high likelihood result, which is actually quite high, um, considering only 2% of the population actually have uh, autism. But when we conducted a user survey, it found that over 71% of caregivers actually had prior concerns. So that would, that would account for the higher um, percentage of children with high likelihood result. We're also conducting an evaluation study of the app, so if anyone is interested in participating, please do contact me and I can send out some of these brochures to you um, and parents can visit um, that um, website, acedetect.org forward slash app to participate in the study. And we've found so far um, that 244 parents have registered, um, 181 have completed an assessment and 38 children were identified at high likelihood for autism, 21%. So that's the same as what we found before. 
And importantly, 15 of the 17 children assessed, so 88% met criteria for autism following a gold standard assessment. So AS Detect is doing really, really well in accurately identifying children uh, on the spectrum. And the other two children had other developmental conditions. So really the ultimate aim of our program is to improve developmental outcomes for children, reduce family stress, increase acceptance of autism and to raise awareness. So um, I thank you all today and I thank everyone that's been involved in the study as well. I'm happy to answer any questions. Fabulous. Thank you, Josie. That was terrific. Um, and just a reminder to please do send through questions. We're getting them through now, which is terrific. And we always love to see more. So thank you, Josie. Uh, on to our final speaker, and then we'll have a bit of question and answers at the end. Uh, a little bit of time, actually, at the end, just a very small amount of time, but we'll make sure we do that. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kaya Evans. So Kaya is our Autism CRC Project Coordinator. Um, working on developing uh, Australia's first national uh, guideline for autism diagnosis. She's also a program manager at the autism research team at the Telephone Kids Institute. Prior to this, Kai was a researcher with the Curtin Quart uh, Autism Research Group, where she was involved in evaluating the specialist peer mentoring program. Kai is an OT who completed a doctoral research on how mothers and carers balance their multiple roles. She's worked as a lecturer, researcher and project manager within an academic setting, along with a range of roles with public and private rehabilitation sector. Over to you, Kaya. Um, so today I'm giving you an update on the guideline process. Last year I presented about the um, progress we had made in our community consultation. Um, and now I'd like to talk to you about some of the things that we've been doing over the last year on the project. So the initial objective of the guideline was to develop Australia's first national guideline for autism diagnosis. Very early on in the process, we realised that a diagnostic evaluation wasn't enough. We needed to also include an assessment of functioning. So we increased the scope of the project. So the specific aims that we were looking at was to develop a rigorous and accurate diagnostic process, something that also identifies strengths and support needs, something that is a flexible process so that it can be adapted to a range of individuals and contexts. It needed to be feasible and practical to administer, and it needed to be acceptable to individuals undergoing assessment and their families, clinicians, and also the government and private systems that support. So in terms of the guideline development process, um, we've taken a very compre comprehensive approach. Last year I spoke um, in quite a bit of detail about the processes we took to collect evidence. This has involved a range of systematic literature reviews, looking at both the published peer-reviewed articles, but also looking at existing clinical guidelines throughout the English-speaking world. In terms of community consultation, many of you listening may have been involved with one of our surveys or workshops. We held workshops in um, all of the capital cities um, across Australia. We also had a range of online surveys and interview options for people to be involved with. The next process was putting together a draft guideline in consultation with our steering committee. And that went out for public consultation and feedback last September. We received over 150 submissions from individuals and organisations, and that started an intensive period of revising the guideline, sending that out to a, to a select group of key stakeholders, primarily our steering group, revising again in response to the feedback. We're currently at the process of getting some external reviews done on the guideline to look at the methodological quality. Uh, we've already had feedback from one independent methodological reviewer and we're anticipating feedback from another two in the near future. At the end of this month, we'll be submitting the guideline to the NHMRC as part of their guideline approval process. During that process, not only will the guideline be reviewed by the NHMRC Council, but it will also be reviewed by a series of international and Australian experts in autism. Following that, um, we will make any changes recommended through that process. And we're hoping that very early in the second half of this year, hopefully July or August, that the guideline will be ready for publication. So in terms of what the guideline will look like, the main guideline document will have um, 
a range of sections in it. So it's really looking to um, provide information on the whole process for conducting the assessment of, function, assessment of functioning and the diagnostic evaluation. This includes outlining the acceptable diagnostic criteria to use. And the note to make is that the guideline isn't rewriting what the criteria are for autism. It is providing a process that sits around the existing criteria. There are six principles um, to guide people when undertaking these assessments. And these include being individually and um, family focused, focusing on the strengths, being holistic and looking at the whole picture, taking a lifespan perspective, ensuring that we're basing the process on evidence and also recognising um, that there's a need for equity for different people and there's not a one size fits all solution. The guideline also outlines the process, in particular that it needs to be a coordinated process and that it needs to exist of a comprehensive needs assessment and a diagnostic evaluation. The roles for different people involved with these assessments is outlined, including the role that the, the individual and their family plays, the assessment team, and also other professionals that will contribute information. A range of settings are described, including clinical, community, and telehealth settings. And then there is a section at the end of the guideline that talks about a range of important considerations um, or different ways that the process may need to be adapted or tailored to individuals. This includes, um, based on age, intellectual and communication ability, gender, their location, whether they're in a regional or remote location, culturally and linguistically diverse populations, people with complex psychosocial needs, and also a section on differential and co-occurring diagnosis. In the blue, I have the various stages of assessment outlined, and there is a chapter on each. So there's the referral process, so how we start a, um, an assessment of functioning and diagnostic assessment. There's the comprehensive needs assessment, which includes both an assessment of functioning and a medical evaluation. There's a two-stage diagnostic evaluation. So this allows for um, a single clinician to undertake the assessment where that leads to a um, diagnostic decision with a high level of confidence and the opportunity to progress forward to a consensus team diagnostic evaluation where further information and a broader range of opinions is required. The guideline also talks about how the information and outcome from um, the assessment of ASD concerns should be shared. And also there's a really strong focus on linking the person to the supports that they require to address their needs. The guideline also has a section at the end where we talk about future practice points. So these are things that were beyond the scope of this guideline, but still really important things to happen within the research, clinical and policy sectors. And there's a range of supporting documents and resources. So I thought that it, um, given that this presentation falls in Autism um, Awareness Month, I thought that I would show you how the guideline links in with a couple of the messages from this year. The theme for 2018 is empowering women and girls on the autism spectrum. And one of the things that we've um, found through the consultation process um, was that a really important issue that we needed to address was the fact that, um, that the statistics and public opinion supports that that females and males present very differently on the autism spectrum and that this is really important to take into consideration during the diagnostic process. Because of that, we have an entire section on gender um, with two recommendations. The other interesting thing that I found was that um, the UN Secretary, Secretary General's quote when launching this year's theme was to talk about promoting full participation of all people on the autism spectrum and to make sure that the necessary supports are in place to allow them to reach their full potential. This is something that um, we feel has really been incorporated in this guideline document with a strong focus on assessment of functioning, identifying strengths and support needs, and making sure that the process involves steps to link people into the supports that they need. So what will we see when the guideline is published later this year? There'll be a full guideline document available for download as a PDF, and that will have hyperlinks through to the other resources available. 
there'll be a summary and rec recommendations document that has basic information to provide a background and then lists off the different recommendations that we've made. There'll be a two page layperson summary that gives an overview of the guideline in easy to understand language. There'll be a series of web resources. So this will include templates such as a medical evaluation form, referral form, uh, example report templates, and also um, resources that can be updated as new information becomes available, such as information about standardised assessments that may be used through the process. There's an administrative and technical report that provides detailed information about the process that we undertook to develop the guideline. For each of the recommendations um, that we made, there'll be evidence tables um, showing the information we found from published literature, as well as from the different consultation processes that we undertook. There's quite a large document where we outline every single submission we received on the draft guideline and the changes that we made. And as they are published, all of the journal articles and conference abstracts will be added to the web page so that you can read up in more detail about the various processes that we took. So in conclusion, I would like to thank all of the people who helped um, and continue to help with developing this guideline. This is certainly not a guideline um, that has been developed by the five members of the research executive group. This is something where the valuable contributions of individuals with lived experience of autism, from professionals involved in the assessment and diagnostic processes, our steering committee representing a wide range of um, national peak body organisations, the external reviewers who have provided input and the broader project team that included research assistants, students, supervisors, um, postdocs, volunteers, methodological experts, administrative support, a whole range of people. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen today and I'd be happy to listen to any of your um, comments um, and answer any of your questions. I've got my contact details there. In the coming days, we'll be adding a, um, a landing page for the guideline to the Autism CRC website. We'll have an opportunity for you to register your interest in receiving an update when the guideline is published. Um, and then that is where the resources will be added as time progresses. Thank you very much. That was fabulous. Thank you so much, Kaya. Um, could I ask um, Valsa and Josie to pop up again? Um, we're going to have enough time for uh, two questions. Uh, um, the first one uh, is to Josie. So, um, uh, Josie, a couple of questions here, so, and I'll roll them into the same question. So, same fa some families have been told they can't have a child assessed until they're older than two years of age. Um, is this true, number one? And secondly, how can we get others to recognise autism uh, in children in the the early years, uh, given there might be some resistance to that. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your questions. And um, this is really a hangover from our previous diagnostic manuals where uh, autism, the, the diagnostic criteria that were used um, were based on uh, a group of three-year-olds. And so it was typically thought then that you couldn't diagnose children under the age of three. And in, in fact, some uh, are saying that you can't diagnose until five. So there has been lots and lots of research since the early 90s showing what these early signs of autism are, which is what we've been using in our um, studies, um, and following up these children to see, okay, can we predict if a child presents with this profile, can we predict if they'll have autism or not? And that's what we do in our studies as well. So you certainly can, with someone that has experience in this age group, you can diagnose by two years of age. Um, and certainly I've been working in this uh, field for a long time and can be diagnosing children um, as early as 18 months, but not all children, but those that do present. And in terms of um, how to have children assessed early, um, you can use the app. Um, so the A is Detect app. You can download it um, on Google, um, the Google Play Store, the Apple iTunes Store. Um, and that can, you can, if you're a parent, you can follow through um, and look at the early signs between 12 and 24 months of age. And that goes all the way up until 30 months of age. So uh, anybody can access that. Even if you're a healthcare professional, you can take a look. Um, the um, this one's directed to Kaya. Um, Kaya, um, uh, this is a uh, a, 
an elephant in the room question. Why in the world is each state different um, in the way that they diagnose autism? Okay, um, so I think that that um, historically falls out of the way that um, the healthcare system is set up in Australia in that it's very much set up as, um, as individual states managing their health systems. So, um, yeah, I, I think that um, each state has undertaken a process, state and territory has undertaken a process that works within their context. Um, and until, you know, without the, um, the centralised process to push this agenda further to do something nationally, um, perhaps everybody's just been coping with, you know, getting through the workload and, and managing what they can do as best as they can. Um, and it's only through this national initiative um, funded by the federal government and administered through the Autism CRC that has those collaborations that it's it's made it possible to move beyond um, everyday practice and, and look at a new way of doing things. Yeah. And yeah, that's something we've had a lot of support for. Yeah, and, and look, just to extend that, and I might throw to Valsa as well, look, it, it, for, from my perspective, it goes back to, you know, the, the founding of Australia where we were a whole bunch of uh, essentially different colonies that were brought together uh, in a constitution in 1901. And um, in that constitution, there are certain things that remain the state's remit and health, um, so diagnosis typically falls under health, um, uh, remains a state-based issue. And the way that um, uh, different systems work is that unfortunately over time, things don't converge on the same thing. They tend to di diverge. Um, and that's the, the sort of place that we've got to um, in Australia. Um, so, uh, and, and this is one of the great promises of the National Disability Insurance Scheme is to bring all of the uh, different disability systems, which of course are state run as well, into the same um, uh, uh, system and, and the same processes, which uh, is of course a huge uh, uh, promise, um, and we certainly hope it will be delivered. Um, Valsa, um, did you want to have anything to add on to that one at all? I would also say that um, through these initiatives, uh, we are going a bit into convergence through national programs. One being the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, no matter which state does what, they all kind of converge into one thing where the principles are the same. Similarly, I'm being hopeful here that um, if we can get our next project through the autism CRC in taking the surveillance into the GP world, that again is a national framework. So every child has access to a GP, every family has access to a GP, that's one common denominator. And I think if we can be creative in finding pathways through that system, then we might be able to make some real changes there as well. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Valsa. Um, look, we, do, we also do have other questions, but I'm afraid we're at time and I'm, I'm quite concerned that uh, everybody uh, has busy lives and will need to um, uh, go and live them. Can I just say thank you to our presenters? Um, all, all three pr um, provided a really quick snapshot, but it was really informative. I was, I was talked the whole way through. Um, thank you also to you for viewing. I see the numbers that are viewing um, online and that we've got some really good numbers of people viewing here this, uh, today, so we really do appreciate it. Um, please do um, uh, realise that this is going to be up on the website, um, on the Autism CRC website in the coming days. Uh, so uh, please do tune in up there and, and refer it on to anyone who you think might get some value out of it. Um, the next uh, webinar will be focused on adulthood and it's at the same time tomorrow, apparently. So I will see you there um, if you would uh, like to tune in. So once again, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Thanks to our um, presenters and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.